Please consider taking down these postings. Give yourself some love and guidance to deal with your behavior and issues. A picture of yourself wearing makeup, talking like a woman and mocking Jehovah's Witnesses is degrading to yourself. Your voice is female, satanic and scary. Please try to regain some pride, respect and dignity. Wow! It is obvious that you were abused. Prefer to be gay and hate everyone because of your miserable childhood. Grow up! Thank you, JW Fairy Tale, for the laughs. Go to JW.org instead. And we and uh, thank you for your uh, comment, Sandra. Uh, Sandra, whatever. Um, it's. A, I appreciate getting comments like these. First of all, you're keeping it real. <laughs> you're keeping it ghetto. Fist bump. Um, I appreciate uh, receiving comments like these, which I do in great abundance. It is a field of interest for me. And also for the uh, future, the futuristic space scientist watching 10,000 years from now. First of all, Guten Tag. I hope this series of videos may be uh, serving some purpose to your space laboratory <laughs> in, re in reconstructing the final years of the human experiment. This is an interesting character study here. You have a perfectly nice looking lady here. This looks like my mom, by the way. I had to do a double take. A uh, perfectly nice mom lady here. And I, I'm sure she's very normal in many other respects of her life, but uh, in reading this paragraph, you may agree that there's almost a mean streak going on. Maybe that's too strong uh, to put it, but there's something here that is decidedly uh, boisterous, agitated, and not really what you expect from a church person, uh, so to say, but... Uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, you may and, and you may be a neighbor of this lady, and you may be taken aback a bit because she may be uh, uh, just just as, as sweet as pie the rest of the time. And but but when on this Jehovah's Witness part of her life, there there's a darkness and something very something very snappy comes out. <laughs> I don't want to well I don't want to put it in too strong of terms, but. It may seem out of character for somebody that you... Oh, you always hear Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the nicest neighbors. But my neighbors, they're so nice. Well, they probably are nice. But this is a learned behavior. And they learned it at the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'll tell you about it. This lady is uh, goes to a place called the Kingdom Hall. And... The, it's it's this group of people, and they're run by these leaders that are called the governing body, and uh, just just the same way that this uh, person Sandra, she looks like a lady, but you were surprised at what came out of her mouth. Well, the governing body are the same way. They they look like businessmen. They dress like gentlemen. They wear suits, and they look uh, and they have that gentlemanly look, but. They don't act like gentlemen, because when they open their mouth, they're rude and crude and keep bringing up things that the Bible says should not even be mentioned among you. Case in point, uh, the big thing going on is uh, uh, some, some pretty seedy uh, public talks that have been given at uh, conventions recently, and it's all the rage. But the uh, Apostle Paul... Uh, the, uh, you know, some of the original Christian guys there, they said to remain focused on things that are chaste and lovable. And, unfortunately, Jehovah's Witnesses have taken a different turn. Instead of focusing on whatever is praiseworthy or has virtue, and those are the things you should be thinking about and talking about, you have, you have this, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness character. His name's Anthony Morris III. You're gonna love him. <laughs> He's a barrel of monkeys. And he's a big, big hit with the kids these days. Anthony Morris the third, not the first two. He's he's the third one. 
He's he's like he's the LeBron James. It's the thing that everyone was waiting for, and it's finally here. The third, the third and the greatest. Good things come in threes. Well, out of the blue, he starts bringing up. Uh, he's he's on the stage of uh, the the Jehovah's Witness assembly, and he starts bringing up women's exercise clothing, and the problem of spandex going up into women's butt cracks and vaginas. Not while they're at the Kingdom Hall. Not while they're at the Kingdom Hall. But while they're exercising. During their workouts. Look, if you're wondering what's going on, there's this problem. This, or they think they have a problem with uh, women's tight clothing apparel. Namely, Spanx and spandex. And the trouble is that women who go jogging outside that may have this type of clothing on, it may start riding up on them and creating butt cleavage or a vagina cleavage. And so, the de facto leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses turned this topic into a sermon. And he gave it to thousands of people. <laughs> Kids, families sitting together, the children and all. And I guess, I, I guess... My point is, all these Sunday morning people here, like Cilantro, Villegas, Plouts, probably one of the people sitting in the audience, for all we know, they're sitting there in their Sunday clothes on this Sunday morning, and none of them were thinking about butt cleavage or vagina cleavage until this Jehovah's Witness leader man brought it to their attention and got them all to think about it, children included. So I will ask you in the audience, would you describe... A 78-year-old man talking about women's spandex going in their vages. Is this something chaste and lovable? And you say, well, the clothing is very offensive. But the Bible says taking offense rests in the bosom of a stupid one. So is your leader stupid? Or does he think you are stupid? And so he picked this topic and tossed it to you because it is the low-hanging fruit. And the audience is stupid and easily offendable, and they will eat it up. Mm, this tastes good. <laughs> Delicious. That was scrummy. Well, these men are our shepherds. And they must answer for us because they're in charge of our sins. You know, this may be an awkward time for me to bring this up, but... Spandex going up into a lady's vag isn't a sin. I know you think it's a sin. <laughs> hey, easy, easy, easy. Calm down. <laughs> Stop. Spandex going into a vagina isn't a sin. I know, I know. It feels salacious. It feels sinful. I read you, I read you. But, take the emotions out of the situation, remove the emotional component, and rethink this. Spandex going into people's cracks, it isn't a sin. A woman jogging in tight pants isn't a sin. It just isn't. What do you think these women are, exhibitionists? Well, they call the police. Call a police station and see if they agree with you. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, uh, report an exhibitionist. All right. Tell me what happened. Well, I was standing on the sidewalk the other day, uh, going out in service. What is going out in service? Oh, uh, it's not important. Um, anyway, this woman from the neighborhood, she was, came jogging past me and she was, well... She was wearing Spanx. What are Spanx? Well, Spanx are what we call spandex at the Kingdom Hall. What is the Kingdom Hall? Oh, uh, never mind. Anyway, this woman, she came running past me wearing these tight pants. And, uh, you know, you can see quite a bit. If you know what I mean. Sir, we recommend... You keep your eyes to yourself from now on. And this phone is not a toy. Mind the ballpark of kind of how that conversation would go down? 
Because, <laughs> buddy boy, I got news for you. I got a stone cold reality check. Please don't care about this woman jogging in her tight pants. They'd be more interested in you and what is going on with you. They'd open a file on you, Sandra. Because <laughs> you did give them a clue that something is going on with you. Something suspicious. Here's what no one has been able to explain to me. What was Anthony Morris III's eyes doing on a woman's crotch? What is this man's eyes doing zeroed in on a woman's crotch cleavage while she is running by? This is a moving target. <laughs> and this man, Anthony Morris III, didn't care about the rest of her. He concerned himself and involved himself in the one centimeter of fabric around her vagina. I'm still waiting for someone to explain to me why Anthony Morris III's eyes are following women around when the Bible says, let my eyes turn away from what is bad. Anthony Morris III did not turn away. He kept looking and he kept thinking about it. And he went home that night and he slept on it. And then he got up and he wrote a talk about it. And now he's going all over the world and all over the country giving that talk to thousands of people. He didn't shun empty speech like the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say shun your family members. It says shun empty speeches. What empty speech is more empty than an old man talking about spanks? But it's okay, right? Because he's a righteous man. Well, let me change the scenery for you a little bit. Imagine Anthony Morris III is at the mall. And he sees a, a crowd of uh, teenage girls and he goes up to one of these girls and he squats down in front of her because she's wearing spandex. And so he squats there and he looks at her crotch. He's staring at it. And the girl's dad sees and he comes running up. And Anthony Morris III tells him it's okay because he's one of Christ's anointed brothers and he's doing research for a talk. Oh, well, then that's appropriate. <laughs> because you're on the governing body. You're a righteous man. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. I didn't recognize you. A woman jogging in tight spandex isn't sexual. I know you think it is. But let me prove to you that it's not. I want you to imagine a fat guy in spandex. A big, fat, hairy, pot-bellied man running in spandex. There you go. Is this still a sexual imagery situation for you? No? You're not turned on anymore? Your boner went limp? <laughs> By the way, I saw a lot of ass crack when I was a JW. <laughs> I'm just keeping, it, just, keep, just keeping it real, folks. I saw ass crack galore. Specifically at hall builds, hall projects, a lot of plumbers crack. Anthony Morse III never gave a talk about that. <laughs> I remember at, all, uh, at our kingdom hall growing up, there was a big, fat woman. Big, big 400-pound behemoth of a woman. And when she stood up for the song, her butt crack would be so drenched with sweat that her moo moo would be bunched all up in her crack. Every meeting, every song. And I'm a little boy standing behind this. Ass crack! Right there! There was another old woman at the hall who would wear cream colored blouses that you could see her nipples through, and they were like bullseyes. And I'm five years old. <laughs> I'm sorry for how unsavory this is getting friends. But my point is, the examples of immodesty, which are very commonplace. Look, these are just two examples, but you probably had something similar at your hall. And these examples of immodesty happen all the time in the Kingdom Hall setting. Anthony Morris III did not give a talk on any of that because it does not entice him. 
The way a beautiful young woman exercising in spandex entices him and plays with his mind. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Whoever this poor woman was that accidentally had the misfortune of jogging past Anthony Morris III, she didn't do anything sexual to him. Do you get that? She probably had her headphones in and is oblivious that some old man was watching her and that all these months later, he's still talking about her and thinking about her. How he imagines he could see the outline of a little bit of her private parts and he's still talking about it. And he's projecting at her, whoever this woman or women are wearing these aerobics outfits, he is insinuating that they are responsible for provoking him and provoking all the other JW men into having lustful desires. It's not the men's fault. It's the spandex women's fault. I don't know. Is this what Anthony Morris is telling his wife? What's going on? Let me ask you a question. You out there in the audience, just a personal question you don't have to answer out loud. You can think in your head. Just a quick question for you. Which is more unclean to you? A photograph of a naked lady or a JW man jacking off to a picture of a naked lady? Which seems dirtier to you? Because every assembly of Jehovah's Witnesses, they drone on and on about the evils of pornography. This isn't one assembly. This is every assembly, every time. Pornography. 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 Acknowledging the toll it keeps taking on Jehovah's people and lamenting how many brothers are disqualified from privileges because their wives <laughs> walked in on them whacking off to porn. And so they had to step down from their privileges. <laughs> By the way, you got to know, for every JW man that got caught looking at porn... You know there was four or five that didn't. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> but what astounds me? Well, first of all, the fact that people who acknowledge having a severe porn problem in their group still think they have the right to go door to door. It's 7.30 in the morning, and they're, they're at the family computer jacking off and having an orgasm squirting like a fire hose, and then it's 9.30, and they're standing on your doorstep. Talk about Jehovah and your obligation to him. <laughs> and they don't see the irony in this. The ironic part of this does not occur to them. They wipe their peepees off with a towel and then go put on a tie so they can sit on your judicial committee. <laughs> anyway, what astonishes me about these assembly parts is they act like it's just something that's happening to them. And they don't really correlate it to the brothers themselves. They act as if it's an unfortunate side effect of being in proximity to Satan's world. Satan's world. They don't approach it with the same clenched fist, draconian way they approach you and talk to you. Because when you do something wrong, it's a sin. But when they do something wrong, it's a weakness. And why would you bring that up? The brothers aren't perfect. Jehovah knows that. We're here at this meeting to talk about you. Not to hear you level accusations against the brothers. We're not going to give you a platform for that. Let's do another mental exercise right now. I want you to imagine uh, a married couple, not, not real people, imagine a uh, fictional married couple who decide they want to spice up their marriage and so they start making amateur porn. Oh, it's very wrong, isn't it? Very naughty. Very, very bad. And we can all agree on that. And they, uh, they begin mass-producing DVDs and uh, making it available to the world. Oh, it's awful, isn't it? But there's a caveat I did not mention. No one ever views the porn that this couple makes. 
for whatever reason, it just doesn't circulate. Not Nobody watches the porn. Nobody ever saw it. Well, who do you disfellowship? And what do you charge them with? Do you disfellowship the elder that clicked on the link and pushed the play button to see the porn? <laughs> Just kidding. But you, you get my point, right? Porn is a, it's, it's a tandem thing. It's a group activity. <laughs> you, porn doesn't, I, I, I've, I've, I've explained this to Jehovah's Witnesses and I don't think they get it. Like, I sat there and literally tried to explain this to a Jehovah's Witness once, and it just went through him. Porn does not exist until you watch it. Porn should not exist in the universe of Jehovah's Witnesses. It just shouldn't. It's not like somebody trying to force you to salute the flag or something. It's porn. You seek it out. You do it. It doesn't have to be porn. It could be anything. Imagine what? Well, imagine drugs. Imagine a big bag full of drugs, illegal drugs, narcotics. It's very bad, right? Right. Now imagine that this big bag of drugs is sitting on a table, and people walk past it all day long, and they don't care. Nobody even notices it's there. What are drugs? I'm, I'm serving God. And they keep walking past it. Nobody touches the drugs. Are the drugs still bad? Imagine the earth is empty and there's nobody on it. Imagine the planet earth is completely empty. Jehovah's up there in the universe. He's sitting up there looking down on the planet earth and it is empty. There's nobody and nothing on earth except one table with a bag of drugs sitting on it. Is Jehovah angry at the drugs? Does Jehovah hate the drugs? What do you think is going on here? The lustful desire Anthony Morris III feels is in his loins. Not in some jogging woman's spandex. Because let me tell you, they don't make spandex tight enough for an anointed co-ruler with Christ to have to worry about. How do I know this? Well, because Jesus, or J-Man as I call him, completed his earthly ministry without referencing women's butt cleavage or vagina cleavage. He managed to do it somehow. Or maybe he forgot and left it out. But he left a model for you to follow closely. You know, like the part where he said, if a man looks at a woman so as to have a desire, he has committed a sin. Unless she's wearing spandex, then the blame shifts around a little bit. You, the viewer, sitting at home, how much of your life, brothers and sisters, have you spent letting Jehovah's Witnesses play this game with you? This game of who's clean, who's not clean, today, tomorrow. You know it's rigged, right? You're never going to change your clothes or conform your appearance enough to meet their idea of what is clean, for them to admit that you are finally clean. You're never going to, they keep moving the goalposts, you're never going to win. You know this, right? It's never going to happen, right? But you keep playing. It's never going to change. This is your life. You're going to you're going to be having gray hair and still doing this. Those roles don't reverse. They're always going to be standing on a glorious stage, surrounded by flowers, pointing their finger down at you, blaming you. Satan's world. They make the porn I'm addicted to. That finger points in one direction. It ain't never going to point back in the other direction. It hasn't pointed in the other direction for a hundred years. You think it's going to happen next week? Hell no. 1975? 
They say it wasn't them. I have the recording. You want me to play it again? I point blank asked an elder who was responsible for 1975, the disaster, the fiasco, the crushed hopes. And he told me the publishers did it. The lowest people in the organization, it was them. And he assured me that none of the people giving assembly parts or writing articles in magazines had anything to do with it. And I even asked him a second time to make sure there was no misunderstanding. There was nothing I was missing. I asked him a second time, did any of the anointed ones have anything to do with 1975? No. No. It was, it was the, uh, the uh, lowest people in the organization. They did it somehow. They'll throw anyone under the bust, as long as it's not them. They'll throw their own slaves under the bus. The smallest, lowest, bottom-rung people in their organization, they call the publishers. The people sitting in offices who never lift a finger, they call the slave. Does this sound like an organization that stands ready to be accountable? <laughs> I think not. I have another recording you may have heard, a video called, Is the Truth Always True? In which I'm talking to another elder for about 15 minutes, and I uh, start to ask a couple of questions about the disfellowshipping practice and how it all works. And he says, uh, you know, I'm pulling up to the kingdom hall right now, so I can't answer that. I have to go. What this man forgot was that I had called him on the kingdom hall phone. I didn't call him on his cell phone. I called the Kingdom Hall. He answered the phone, Kingdom Hall. There was people talking in the background. It was the Kingdom Hall. That man lied to me. An elder lied to someone asking Bible questions. Witnessing, shitnessing. He didn't care. Eternal life, shit turn life. He threw a householder under the bus the moment it wasn't fun or easy anymore. The first couple of questions that weren't a quick uh, answer, it wasn't easy for him. So he bailed. He abandoned his responsibility to someone else's eternal life because there was nothing in it for him. What do you think is going on, by the way? You think Jehovah is sitting up there in the universe saying, oh, these people who won't tell you the truth about 1975, I need you to listen to them about spandex. Because it's very important to me. And I get angry. <laughs> the Kingdom Hall people. They're not interested in telling you what's true, or even what is true. They don't care about it. But you think they care about you? Well, how does that work? Why is there a giant, seven-foot-tall pyramid statue that says Watchtower on it? Oh, uh, Christendom did that. It was the Churches of Christendom. But it says Watchtower Society on the front of it. Oh, uh, it's just a thing. Anyway, never mind that. Let's get back to the topic of what kind of clothes you have on. You starting to see how this works? Are you someone who has spent very much time around JWs? Did it seem like they were just trying to get dirt on you all the time? Kicking dirt on you? Big glass of dirt, just pouring it on you all the time. You keep hearing these stories and experiences of JWs parked outside people's houses with binoculars. Like they're doing a stakeout. 
that isn't making excuses for one another or forgiving each other 77 times. That's the opposite, right? There's nothing in the first century model about doing stakeouts. This is their invention. Done under their own compulsion. Driving them to do something that borders on being illegal. Because that's how bad they need the dirt. Dirt on you makes them seem clean by comparison. So it's never enough. Because they keep getting dirt on them, and so they need more dirt on you. Buckets of dirt. Buckets and buckets of dirt. Truckloads. Disfellowship people sitting in the back row of the Kingdom Hall with their ties off. Hanging their heads in shame, looking guilty. They need those people there. They couldn't have it any other way. You think Jehovah's Witnesses don't like disfellowship people? They love it. Without disfellowship people, they'd lose their identity. They wouldn't know what to do with themselves. Disfellowship people, it's their, it's their portrait of Dorian Gray. What do you think would happen to them without it? They need those guilty looking people sitting in the back row to validate them. While they give their talks about the, uh, the sin of women's exercise clothes going up into their cracks while they're exercising. What's next? The sin of water going up your butt while you're bathing? First Thessalonians 4, 11 says for Christians to live quietly and mind their own business. You going to tell me these people live quietly and mind their own business? Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, then they're not really Christians, are they? Right? Well, then what are they? And why are they bossing you around, taking a huge shit on you every chance they get? You want to know what I think? I think the reason they put so much emphasis on dress and grooming is because it's all they've got. It's the only thing that really distinguishes them from the rest of the world. Look at our suits and ties. How presentable we are. <laughs> the little ones, too. Look how modest our women are. <laughs> every assembly, every assembly and convention, 85% of the time is spent congratulating themselves on dressing neatly <laughs> and appropriately. <laughs> I don't know, does that seem disproportionate to you? Have you been to an assembly, friends? And heard the stories and experiences that Jehovah's Witnesses give. They have them stand on the stage and tell the other witnesses about how they were in a hotel or how they were in a restaurant. And a perfect stranger walks up to them and says, I want to commend you for being so well-dressed. Because people do that. Experiences of... Uh, somebody who was an, uh, an unbeliever, somebody who objected to the witnesses because they knew very little about them, but they just knew that they didn't like Jehovah's Witnesses or had a bad attitude about the whole thing. And so they decided to attend uh, the, the convention with their believing mate, and they were astonished to see such polite and well-dressed people. And the brother continues that this unbeliever was expecting to see people spitting on the floor and fighting with each other over parking spaces. And instead, he sees well-dressed people sitting together peacefully? He expected mayhem at a Bible convention and smelly people. <laughs> it's a... Uh, it's, it's, every, it's the dog and poodle show. It's, it's every assembly. Brothers and sisters, do you go to these assemblies? It's the same thing every time. Over and over, they have 
It's predictable. It's like clockwork. They'll have the brother will be giving a talk, and then they'll have a line of people silently walk out on the stage with their microphones, <laughs> and then turn simultaneously and face the audience, and one by one give experiences about how they were able to make a placement because their boss or whoever was so amazed and impressed by how neatly dressed they are. And I'm thinking, really? Because it's not like you're wearing a gold lame suit or something. You just got your, your shirt tucked in or whatever. I mean, is this really blowing away worldly people? Because they're, it's, I mean, Jehovah's Witnesses, the, it, they're like, they're organized? Is this really blowing people's socks off? Well, it must be true because it's not made up lies. Uh, it's, uh, you're at the convention of the truth. And so these things happened. <laughs> anyway, if you've been to these assemblies, you know that this is their uh, demonstrable proof. That they are separate and better than the world at large. It's the evidence that they present and they march it out on stage every time, every time, every single assembly. And so you have to wonder at some point, is it easier to always look clean than to always be clean? Is this their Superman outfit? No? You don't think so? I see you shaking your head no. Well, I invite you to try it out. Here's what I want you to do. Go up to an elder and say, can I not wear a suit and still get into the kingdom? And the elder would say, oh, well, well why don't you want to wear a suit? And you say, oh, I can wear a suit. I've done it for years. It's just I'm tired of it. And since we're always being uh, encouraged with First Peter saying to uh, let the secret person of the heart be our incorruptible apparel. In a quiet and mild spirit be our clothing before God. I just want to do that from now on. And the elder says, Well, I guess if someone were in an iron lung and they were in a hospital, then Jehovah would understand that limitation. No, 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 I don't mean a hypothetical person in a hospital. I mean me, today. Can I be part of Jehovah's organization without wearing a suit? Uh, no. No, brother, you need to be wearing a suit. Because that's how you qualify for the field ministry, which you need to be doing to get into the kingdom. You see, it's not us you're conforming for, brother. Please, please don't get this wrong. It's not us. It's about us keeping a business-like appearance to give that good impression to the householder. But if we change our values to impress worldly people, aren't we becoming unevenly yoked with unbelievers? Because you're telling me that clothes don't matter, but we're playing a mind game with them? And this goes on and on until the elder finally settles it by saying, he reads you the scripture that says that the uh, road to salvation is cramped and narrow and few are the ones finding it. Have you ever had that moment where you're uh, at a convention, you're walking around at the convention and you see thousands and thousands of people everywhere you look, every direction. Thousands of people wearing identical suits and skirts. And you get this feeling that it just doesn't feel like you're on a cramped and narrow road anymore. Because it's the clothes that get into the kingdom, right? That suit... And that dress are walking into the kingdom, regardless of who's in them, right? Because that's the first thing they tell you. You are disposable. Don't you get an attitude, buddy? Because we will throw you out like last week's Chinese food.
That's the first thing they tell you, right? And they never let you forget it. You are disposable. People are interchangeable. The clothes are a necessity, right? You take 50 suits and 50 dresses and you spread them out on Kingdom Hall chairs. You have a congregation, right? Tell me how I am not right! Type and detail it for me. Get in the comment section and explain to me how I got it wrong. This isn't new stuff, by the way. I remember 15 years ago, I'm dating myself here, <laughs> about 15 years ago, denim skirts were an act of rebellion. Then it was black pantyhose and casual shoes <laughs> and so forth. You think tight pants are a homosexual conspiracy? Well, when I was your age, there was a feminist conspiracy going on at the Kingdom Hall. A feminist conspiracy called pantsuits that had infiltrated God's people. It was the practice of women wearing business pants in defiance of the family arrangement and male headship. And this rebellion was quashed and the conspiracy was detected and destroyed. <laughs> oh, and there's been other conspiracies. The uh, music industry. The movie industry, professional sports, uh, popular culture, your job. All of these things are part of a larger conspiracy to slowly make JWs fall away from the truth. What's very convenient, though, is that no one from the other side of this issue is ever on the stage to give a rebuttal. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> That'd be something else, wouldn't it? If in an act of fairness, Anthony Morris invited a guest speaker, a gay guy, and had a podium next to his while he gives his talk. <laughs> I'm sure that will happen someday. Um, Anthony, this isn't going to be easy for you to hear, but tight pants? It's just fabric, honey. The dicks are in your mind. Because that's your complaint, right? The fabric is almost tight enough where you could see the outline of a pee-pee. But Anthony, normal people don't stare at each other's crotches. I can't tempt you with my wiener. You can only tempt yourself. So here's my advice. From now on, make eye contact with people. And keep your dirty thoughts to yourself. And worry about your own pants. Okay? Also, you might want to think about a personal trainer. It's worth the money. Just between us men. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. We'll see. JWTV, it's the new thing. We'll see how it unfolds. Here's my question. Every assembly, they rehash these same old tropes again. The old standbys. Misogyny. Homophobia. Bigotry against Christendom, slander against the world and those in it. At what point will it dawn on you that it's a big lie and there is no conspiracy? You got this new cartoon on DVD. <laughs> what the fuck? It's Become Jehovah's Friend. Become Jehovah's Friend. They're not even willing to be my friend. And I'm a human being in their family that's standing in front of them on earth. The Bible says anyone that loves God but hates their brother is a liar. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses are instructed to hate former Jehovah's Witnesses. So what does that make them? You tell me. Friends do not lie to their friends. Friends don't lie to each other. Did your friends give you a require brochure? You know, the require brochure. 
The smiling people with big heads! And you complete the brochure, and you've met God's requirements! On the other hand, you have Jesus saying you cannot meet God's requirements. You can't. You won't. That's not how it works. Your only hope is to drop to your knees, admit this to God, admit it to yourself, and maybe, maybe, begin to learn something about humility instead of entitlement. JW say, no, 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 no. That was before the require brochure. You have a require brochure now. <laughs> Follow the instructions and you have met God's requirements. He made a brochure about it. You wear a suit, you be on time to the meetings, and you do as you're told. And do what the brothers say. You got like a 90% chance of living forever. That's pretty good. <laughs> share with you a uh, experience I had as a younger man. This is, I, I was 18 and a half, young person, young person at the hall, and I had purchased a bottle of styling gel. I never used styling gel before, this was a new thing for me, but I had this trendy new haircut of, uh, it was kind of the look that young people had back then, it was short and choppy, and the young men would spike it up in the front and kind of have that look and I that was the look I was going for and so I uh, styled my hair in this fashion and this went on for a couple of weeks until at a Tuesday night book study an elder came up to me and said oh brother I noticed you're doing something a little bit different with your hair is this a is this a fashion thing and I didn't know what to say <laughs> and he, um, well, apparently the elder had prepared for this uh, little in encounter he was going to have with me, and he had a folded up watchtower, uh, folded to an article about the peacock, and this article was about how a uh, pe peacock, in, in an act of vanity, raises its feathers to get attention, and the, the elder asked me if... Uh, if I felt like a peacock when I look in the mirror and I decide to spike it up with some hair gel. Is this something you're doing for Jehovah or for yourself, brother? Because the scriptures encourage us to do all things for God's glory. Next time before coming to the Kingdom Hall, I encourage you to think about what benefits Jehovah instead of what benefits your vanity. And I, of course, I went straight home and washed the stuff out of my hair. And I, for, for a long time after that, I beat myself up. I felt lousy. I felt embarrassed and humbled that I had... I was embarrassed that I I was like a peacock and that I had I had shown everyone how immature and vain I was and I and I hoped that they would in time that this would pass and people would forget about it because I had made a fool out of myself by using hair gel and uh, for years, this was, this was a pivotal thing for me because for years after that, I remembered that night and how in my arrogance, I had become puffed up and started styling my hair like I was something. Like I was something to be looked at in Jehovah's house. It's not my house, it was Jehovah's house. And I was humbled and I felt bad for a long time. By the way, I'm going to take a wild shot in the dark here, and I'm just going to totally guess that something like this may have happened to some of you out there in the audience. And it doesn't have to be how your hair was styled. It could be a garment of clothing, your automobile, your hobby, your field of interest, whatever. I'm going to take this wild stab in the dark that some elder came up to you at some point and made you feel bad, made you feel guilty 
because you had you had this thing about yourself that was inappropriate most likely dressing grooming the most common and that you were like me and that you began stripping away at yourself that's what I did I spent years after this this really set the tone for my 20s in a large way I spent years scraping and cutting away parts of myself flushing them down the toilet anything that was creative or your unique or cool or creative I I I I I uh, I, I tried to, to pull this off of me like it was dirty clothes and I was gonna put on the new clothes of the new personality right Let me ask you, all these years later, in retrospect, all these years later, when those men from the governing body finally come out of the shadows, and you get to see them on JWTV, how empty and how hollow did your sacrifices feel when you saw those men wearing pinky rings on their little fingers? How hollow did you feel inside? By the way, the reason for all of this is to... The reason JWs do the whole, the whole dress and grooming routine is to not offend the householder, officially. It's not about offending each other. It's about the householder, you see. Well, I gotta tell you something. I live out here in farm country, small town Midwestern America. Maybe this is wrong. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this. Forgive me, friends. But do you know what they call, out here in Kansas where I live, you know what they call someone who wears a suit? A liar. That's not a punchline, by the way. They don't need to know you. You come up to their door wearing a suit, they don't need to know you. Or what your magazine says. They know it's a trick. They know whoever you are, whatever you're about, it's not honest. Wherever your money came from, it's not honest. This Watchtower edict about people uh, always dressing in suits, boy, it never did us any favors. Going door to door in farm country. I just want you to imagine walking up to a farmhouse, ringing the doorbell on this farmer's house, and the lady comes to the door, and you begin reading, uh, <laughs> reading scriptures from the Bible with a pinky ring. You have a pinky ring on your little finger. You're Samuel Hurd, and you're turning pages with your pinky ring. And the farmer's wife says, Do you excuse me? I have something in the oven. And she shuts the door and goes back into her house. The farmer says, who was that? Some man wearing a pinky ring. Now, I don't know in the same situation how a woman wearing spandex would be received if she just went up to some farmhouse. But I will tell you something for damn sure. By the way, how long is this? How, how long has this vi vi video been? 30 minutes? It could have been 30 seconds. All I had to do is hold up a picture of the governing body wearing pinky rings. Because that's the end, right? Nothing comes after that. <laughs> that's a game ender. If you're, in the, if you're in the religion business, right? Pinky rings. Can you blame the householder for not being interested in Jehovah's Witnesses after pinky rings? What are you going to do? Go to their door and, and start preaching to them about how the time has drawn short? And they say, well, it hasn't drawn so short to prevent you from shopping for a pinky ring, I see. Samuel Hurd, Jarrett Loesch, fat guys wearing pinky rings. Stephen Lett, 
wearing pinky rings, pinky decorations. Fat people in pinky rings. It's even worse. Does that sound like somebody that's pummeling their body and leading it as a slave? Or demonstrating lowliness of mind? Is this the secret person of the heart the Bible talked about? Letting your light shine before men? By the way, this pinky ring, this symbol of opulence and great wealth, they didn't come out of a Cracker Jack box, right? They went to a jewelry store. These people that don't have jobs went to a jewelry store with your money, oh, excuse me, Jehovah's money from the donations and bought pinky rings for themselves. Oh, you don't know that, J.W. Fairytale? Uh... Uh, a wealthy JW who, who uh, could afford those rings may have purchased it as a gift. Surely not. Because that would be an act of simony, right? Surely not. Simony, something God punishes by death. If a rich JW tried to buy a member of the governing body an expensive ring... Of course he would say, brother, bless your heart, but I cannot accept this ring. I know you don't mean it this way, but it would appear as though something inappropriate is going on here. Since a Christian like me has no use for a ring like that. I know you mean well, and I appreciate the gesture, but brother, sell this ring and give the money to the poor. Or put it in the contribution box. Or whatever. But one thing's for sure. I'm not going to go on JWTV wearing a pinky ring. Give that money to the needy. <laughs> I'm sure that's how that conversation went. Ah, forget all that. Who wears a pinky ring? <laughs> Brothers and sisters. Who wear? What decent person wears a pinky ring? That's like something Caligula would wear. <laughs> Anthony Morris thinks that homosexuals make tight pants. Well, who does he think designs pinky jewelry? It's like a cock ring. These, these fat guys on the governing body. What's this ring supposed to symbolize? I don't even get it. Is it like a cock ring? Is it... Is that, is their stubby appendage and wiggling it around and it's like an inside joke with all of them. It's like being on one of these game shows on TV, win, lose, or draw, or whatever these uh, charade shows, and the Dick Clark guy gives a clue to the contestant, and they start pantomiming, and they pretend they have a big, beautiful ring, and they slip it on their pinky finger, <laughs> and start drinking out of a goblet, and acting it all out, and the other person's like, uh, Roman Emperor, Caligula, Nero, uh, bzz. oh, we're sorry. The correct answer was God-fearing person. the kingdom hall not while they're at the kingdom hall but while they're exercising during their workouts look if you're wondering what's going on there's this problem this or they think they have a problem with uh women's tight clothing apparel namely Spanx and spandex and the trouble is that women who go jogging outside that may have this type of clothing on, it may start riding up on them and creating butt cleavage or a vagina cleavage. And so, the de facto leader of the Jehovah's Witnesses turned this topic into a sermon. And he gave it to thousands of people. 
<laughs> Kids, families sitting together, the children and all. And I guess, I, I guess my point is, all these Sunday morning people here, like Cilantro, Villegas, Plouts, probably one of the people sitting in the audience, for all we know, they're sitting there in their Sunday clothes on this Sunday morning, and none of them were thinking about butt cleavage or vagina cleavage until this Jehovah's Witness leader man brought it to their attention and got them all to think about it, children included. So I will ask you in the audience, would you describe a 78-year-old man talking about women's spandex going in their vages? Is this something chaste and lovable? And you say, well, the clothing is very offensive. But the Bible says taking offense rests in the bosom of a stupid one. So is your leader stupid? Or does he think you are stupid? And so he picked this E. And uh, just, just the same way that this uh, person, Sandra, she looks like a lady, but you were surprised at what came out of her mouth. Well... The governing body are the same way. They, they look like businessmen. They dress like gentlemen. They wear suits. And they look, uh, and they have that gentlemanly look. But they don't act like gentlemen. Because when they open their mouth, they're rude and crude and keep bringing up things that the Bible says should not even be mentioned among you. Case in point, uh, the big thing going on is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, some some pretty seedy uh, public talks that have been given at uh, conventions recently, and it's all the rage. But the uh, Apostle Paul, uh, the uh, you know some of the original Christian guys there, they said to remain focused on things that are chaste and lovable. And unfortunately, Jehovah's Witnesses have taken a different turn. Instead of focusing on whatever is praiseworthy or has virtue, and those are the things you should be thinking about and talking about. You have, you have this uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness character. His name's Anthony Morris III. You're going to love him. <laughs> he's a barrel of monkeys. And he's a big, big hit with the kids these days. Anthony Morris III, not the first two. He's, he's the third one. He's, he's, like, he's the LeBron James. It's the thing that everyone was waiting for, and it's finally here. The third. The third and the greatest. Good things come in threes. Well, out of the blue, he starts bringing up, uh, he's, he's on the stage of uh, the, the Jehovah's Witness Assembly, and he starts bringing up women's exercise clothing and the problem of spandex going up into women's butt cracks and ginas. Not uh, serving some purpose to your space laboratory <laughs> in, re in reconstructing the final years of the human experiment. This is an interesting character study here. You have a perfectly nice looking lady here. This looks like my mom, by the way. I had to do a double take. A uh, perfectly nice mom lady here. And I, I'm sure she's very normal in many other respects of her life. But uh, in reading this paragraph, you may agree that there's almost a mean streak going on. Maybe that's too strong uh, to put it. But there's something here that is decidedly... Uh, boisterous, agitated, and not really what you expect from a church person, uh, so to say. But uh, with Jehovah's Witnesses, you may and, and you may be a neighbor of this lady, and you may be taken aback a bit because she may be uh, uh, just just as, as sweet as pie the rest of the time. And but but when on this Jehovah's Witness part of her life. There, there's a darkness, and something very, something very snappy comes out. <laughs> I don't want to. Well, I don't want to put it in too strong of terms, but it may seem out of character for somebody that you. Oh, you always hear Jehovah's Witnesses. They're the nicest neighbors, but my neighbors are so nice. Well, they probably are nice, but if this is a learned behavior. And they learned it at the Kingdom Hall of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I'll tell you about it. This lady is uh, goes to a place called the Kingdom Hall. And the, it's, it's this group of people and they're run by these leaders that are called the governing body. <laughs> Please 
consider taking down these postings. Give yourself some love and guidance to deal with your behavior and issues. A picture of yourself wearing makeup. Talking like a woman and mocking Jehovah's Witnesses is degrading to yourself. Your voice is female, satanic, and scary. Please try to regain some pride, respect, and dignity. Wow! It is obvious that you were abused. Prefer to be gay and hate everyone because of your miserable childhood. Grow up! Thank you, JW Fairy Tale, for the laughs. Go to JW.org instead. And we and uh, thank you for your uh, comment, Sandra. Uh, Sandra, whatever. Um, it's a. I appreciate getting comments like these. First of all, you're keeping it real. <laughs> you're keeping it ghetto. Fist bump. Um, I appreciate uh, receiving comments like these, which I do in great abundance. It is a field of interest for me, and also for the uh, future, the futuristic space scientist. Watching 10,000 years from now, first of all, Guten Tag. I hope this series of videos may be topic and tossed it to you because it is the low-hanging fruit and the audience is stupid and easily offendable and they will eat it up. Mm, this tastes good. <laughs> Delicious. That was scrummy. Well, these men are our shepherds. And they must answer for us, because they're in charge of our sins. You know, this may be an awkward time for me to bring this up, but... Spandex going up into a lady's vag isn't a sin. I know you think it's a sin. <laughs> hey, easy, easy, easy. Calm down. <laughs> Stop. Spandex going into a vagina isn't a sin. I know, I know, it feels salacious. It feels sinful, I read you, I read you. But, take the emotions out of the situation, remove the emotional component, and rethink this. Spandex going into people's cracks, it isn't a sin. A woman jogging in tight pants isn't a sin. It just isn't. What do you think these women are? Exhibitionists? Well, then call the police. Call a police station and see if they agree with you. Uh, yes, I'd like to uh, uh, report an exhibitionist. All right. Tell me what happened. Well, I was standing on the sidewalk the other day, uh, going out in service. What is going out in service? Oh, uh, it's not important. 